time traveling through women's history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. It's 1861, and Army Private Franklin Thompson is lining up for the surgeon's inspection. His hands are sweating. He's nervous. This exam is the only thing standing between him and adventure as a Civil War soldier. Some people say the inspectors ask recruits to strip for their medical exam. Will Frank have to? He must be holding his breath as the doctor goes to touch his small, unusually soft hands. Because Franklin Thompson isn't a man, but a woman, trying to claim a place in the greatest conflict of the age. Sarah Emma Edmonds did many wild and adventurous things. She ran away from home as a teen and lived for years as a man, making her own way through the world. She served three years in the Union Army, nursing, fighting, and spying, then wrote a best-selling book about it all. Later, she became one of the only acknowledged women soldiers to get a pension for her military service. In a time when a woman's role was fixed and certain, she lived on her own terms, no matter what it cost. Grab your best suit, a Bible, and some very small boots. Let's go traveling. But first, a shout out to some of my patrons, Pirate Queens Edie, Emily, and Jessica, and my lady presidents, Amy, Brendan, Avery, Caroline, Elizabeth, Eve, Jackie, Caitlin, Karen, Lauren, Louisa, Lindsay, Nancy, Paul, and Walter. If you haven't yet listened to episode 5 on Lady Soldiers, I'd go back and do that now. It'll really help you appreciate everything Emma has to face. Sarah Emma Evelyn Edmondson was born in New Brunswick, Canada in 1841. Her parents, Isaac and Betsy Edmondson, were both immigrants. Isaac's people had originally come over from Scotland. When he decided it was time to find him a wife and have some babies, he quite literally plucked Betsy right off an Irish boat. New Brunswick wasn't an easy place to be a dirt farmer. In this wild, sparsely populated frontier, the winters were frigid, the fogs intense, the soil difficult. So when Isaac married Betsy, he did so with the hopes of fathering a brood of sons to lend a hand. But instead, he got himself several daughters in quick succession, Eliza, Francis, and Mary Jane, and then, finally, Thomas. But wait, Thomas had epilepsy, which made him pretty much a dud in old Isaac's eyes. With each new birth, Isaac grew more bitter and rageful. So it was that when their last child came along, Isaac was itching for a healthy boy. But instead, he got Emma. He resented all his children, but particularly that last one. His last child, his last hope, turned against him. There was always a coldness in him, Emma said, and she felt it all her young life. So Emma did what she could to win her father's approval. She became a hard-working tomboy, and the son that her father wished he'd had. Not that he really noticed. She got really good at frontier stuff. Horseback riding, wood chopping, fishing, and generally being outdoorsy. She and her brother Thomas would stalk through the woods with their guns, though she was a much better shot than he was. In fact, she was a better shot with a rifle than almost any boy from miles around. Yes! Naturally, this rugged childhood inspired a fondness for pants wearing, a pastime that was probably easier to get away with out on the Canadian frontier. But none of that mattered to her father. Her efforts never inspired any praise from him. Emma worshipped her mother, who was deeply religious. They regularly attended an Anglican church where, from an early age, she felt a deep connection to God that would inform much of her worldview. It gave her a sense that someone was always looking out for her, keeping her safe, guiding her destiny. Unlike some farm girls, Emma did get some formal education. She went to an Anglican log house school, where she learned reading, writing, and some geography. So, no needlework and lessons on how to be a lady and get married, but also no Latin or Greek. Harvest time often came between her and her learning, but there was one book that you might say helped shape the path she would take. When Emma was 13, a peddler came by the house and, perhaps seeing a spark in her, 
gave her a novel. It was the first one she'd ever read. Emma was enthralled by Fanny Campbell, the female pirate captain, published in 1844. She was particularly pleased by how Fanny chopped off her hair, disguised herself as a boy, and went off to sea to find adventure in the great blue yonder. The one thing she definitely didn't like was why Fanny did it, to rescue a dashing fiancé. In Emma's opinion, that was something to pity her for. I regretted that she had no higher ambition than running after a man. And as exciting as it must have been to girls in the Victorian age, the book does conform to Victorian ideals of womanhood. In the end, after rescuing her lover and the rest of the crew, Fanny goes home, gets married, and takes up her place in the private sphere. And like we talked about last episode, the female warrior bold motif only really works if the girl remains chaste, fights for love or country, and then gets married or dies at the end. Um... But Fanny is radical in the way it heralds a woman being assertive and brave. It legitimized the notion that a woman could be virtuous and adventurous if she played her cards right. That stuck with Emma. She said that, after reading it, I felt as if an angel had touched me with a live coal from off the altar. I went home that night with a problem of my life solved. But there was one big life problem that Emma still had to tackle, and that was how to get out of getting married. She'd seen how her father treated her mother. She was his inferior in every way, a servant to be commanded, not an equal to be admired. Isaac often beat her, just like he beat his frail son and his daughters, and often chastised her in public. Real father of the year over here. Someone get this guy a medal. And maybe a mercury enema. In short, his foul treatment enraged Emma, filling her with a hatred of men. And I mean, fair enough. In our family, the women were not sheltered but enslaved. Hence, I naturally grew up to think of man as the implacable enemy of my sex. I had not an atom of faith in any one of them. If occasionally I met one who seemed a little better than the others, I set him down in my mind as a wolf in sheep's clothing, and probably less worthy of trust than the rest. Not that her opinions or wants really mattered to Isaac. He planned to marry off his daughters, quick smart. Emma watched her sisters being sold off to men in the neighborhood. When she was 17, she noticed an elderly, freshly widowed neighbor watching her a little too keenly as she pulled those potatoes. Her father noticed too, and soon struck up a deal with this neighbor. And Emma was like, hard pass, hard pass. We don't know how Emma actually made her escape. Perhaps her mother helped her. Perhaps it was a family friend. All we know is that she did it, and that dear old dad pursued her. Soon enough, she realized she'd have to go further afield if she didn't want him to find her. But how to get free? This is a time when it's very difficult for women to travel by themselves without some kind of male chaperone. It would look suspicious. Someone would definitely find her out. Or she'd just be vulnerable. Though, that said, it's not like she'd grown up in the cult of true womanhood. But there's a flip side to that coin. Emma was poor. She had no money to run away with. It would be really hard, as a woman, to make a living on her own. At least, to make one that she wanted. With so much going against her, most women would have just gone home. But Emma did something truly radical. This girl, alone and still in her teens, put on pants, cut off her hair, and made up a new identity, Franklin Thompson. Not exactly a pirate captain, but halfway there. It's Frank who replied to a job ad as a traveling Bible salesman, kicking off a whole new life. In many ways, it was the perfect job for Emma. She'd be able to travel and thus avoid her father finding her and enjoy some freedom while she was at it. But at first, she was so worried about being recognized that she traveled at night and slept in the woods during the day. Tired and hungry, she knew that it was time to try and sell some books. But those first visits going door to door must have been completely sweat-inducing. What if they didn't buy her disguise? What if they looked past her clothes and knew? But her fears turned out to be unfounded. The strangers bought her persona every time. Emma was pretty tall for her era and rather lithe from her years of hard labor. She had a strong jaw and cheekbones, not exactly a delicate flower. 
people tended to take a liking to young Franklin Thompson. She outdid most of the company's other salesmen, making enough money to get along quite well. Over the next few years, she prospered, buying nice clothes. She even bought a horse and buggy. Basically, she made mad money and a whole lot of admirers. And some of those were ladies. She took them to balls, drove around with them in her fancy carriage. She even prompted one or two to fall in love with her. Whoops. How did she pull off courtship, you wonder? Well, for one, courtship was different in the 1850s. These dates would have involved little more than closely watched conversations. No one would have been copping a feel. Well, unless they were trying really hard. But let's dig deeper. Why would Emma call that kind of attention to herself when impersonating a man was illegal? And when we can be pretty sure, given what happens to her later, that she's not same-sex inclined. I mean, it wasn't very often that such laws were enforced, but there was the risk that she'd be sent home to Isaac, which must have scared her more than anything else. Plus, it must have taken a toll on her soul to live a lie like that. She would never have been able to be fully relaxed or fully honest. So why take ladies out on the town? Why continue to live as a man at all? Well, perhaps because she missed her sisters, yearned for the female company she'd been surrounded by all her life. Or maybe it was because, it turned out, that life as the enemy was just a little too sweet to give up. But her fortune didn't last forever. Emma somehow lost all of her money, left with nothing but her sample Bible and one gold pocket watch. Who even knows what happened to that fancy carriage? Broke, she struck down south for Hartford, Connecticut, home of the Bible publisher whose books she'd been selling. It was an epic journey that involved walking through feet of snow, cold and hungry, hitching a ride on the occasional horse sleigh. By the time girl arrived in Hartford, she was, as she put it, a stranger in a strange country, a fit subject for a hospital, without money and without friends. She sold what remained of her valuables, rented a room and a new suit of clothes, took a nap, and trotted off to Hurlburt and Company. She introduced herself, as Frank Thompson, of course, and then, Almost in the same breath I asked them if they had any use for a boy who had neither money nor friends, but who was hard to beat on selling books. They laughed a good, hearty, manly laugh. And so they hired her. She traveled back and forth between Canada and the U.S. for a while, selling books with great success. During nine months in Nova Scotia, she earned back all of her lost money and then some, and even managed to squeeze in more than one date though some of them had occasionally awkward consequences. She wrote later that she came pretty close to marrying a girl in Nova Scotia. Being fine comes at a price, you know? During that time, she earned over $900. That's $100 a month. Compare that to the $8 to $10 she would have earned as a domestic servant, and you can see how she got over her scruples real quick. From there, she traveled west, eventually landing in Detroit and then Flint, Michigan. She was there in 1860 when the call to arms from President Lincoln came. A war was starting, and she watched as many of her friends joined up amidst the patriotic fervor. Emma found herself at a crossroads. She was Canadian and a woman, and thus wasn't required in any way to stay and fight. But she believed in the Union, and she was against slavery. What part could she play in what she called this great drama? Should she volunteer as a female nurse or join up as a soldier? If she signed up as a woman, she'd have to give up Frank Thompson. And she'd been him for so long, living the best years of her life. Frank would see a lot more action than Emma would, and a lot more freedom. And because she'd been living as a man for a while, she would have felt the same pressure to join up as the rest of them. There was a lot of it going around. The question was, was she willing to take her deception to that level? Under the scrutiny of the U.S. Army, would she even be able to pull it off? As a devout Christian, the whole Frank versus Emma issue must have been a thorny one. So she prayed on it. I was not able to decide for myself, she said. I carried this question to the throne of grace and found a satisfactory answer there. And 19-year-old Emma decided it was God's will that she join up. It was probably the throne of grace she was thinking of as she stood nervously in line at Fort Wayne in Detroit, waiting for the doctor to examine her. As we discussed in our last episode, these exams weren't often very thorough, though they were supposed to be. Government regulations said that. 
In passing a recruit, the medical officer is to examine him stripped, to see that he has free use of all his limbs, that his chest is ample, that his hearing, vision, and speech are perfect. And so on. But so many people were joining up so quickly that they often involved nothing more than a few taps and bumps, clothes left on. The army needed bodies, functioning eyes, some teeth, and enough fingers to pull a trigger. But Emma didn't know that. No doubt she would have been terrified of being caught. And if she was, she'd be turned away and maybe laughed at, as many of the women who tried to join up were. When her turn came, the doctor looked her over, then wrapped his fingers around her wrist. Her hands were one of her biggest tells. They were small, delicate, and no longer had the calluses they developed when she was a farm girl. Those hands could ruin her. The doctor looked her right in the eye and asked, And what sort of living has this hand earned? She replied, The hand has been chiefly engaged in getting an education. And that was it. Emma was in. Aw, yeah. Or rather, Frank was in, part of the 2nd Michigan Infantry. She told herself that God approved of her mission and excitedly headed off to Washington in June 1861 for basic training. Life in Washington was loud, hectic, and full to bursting with soldiers. Still green recruits marched down the mall. They lounged in senator seats in the Congress building. The tents they stayed in were seven by seven, made for two to four men. A lot of women soldiers ended up caught at this early stage, failing to pass under such close quarters and scrutiny. And also, these men didn't know how to mend ripped pants, wash a dish, or do laundry. Hey Johnny, how do you use this needle thing to sew on a cons arm button? It was sometimes a suspicious amount of knowledge in the domestic arts that got some women caught in the ranks, so Emma made sure to dumb down her skills as much as possible. She had years of practice of being Frank Thompson, and was used to, and enjoyed, hard work, routine, and long days. Hers were certainly long. They started at 5 a.m., an early call time that meant, conveniently for Emma, that soldiers tended to sleep in their clothes. She'd get breakfast, then moved on to endless drilling and dress parades in the streets. This was a civilian army, not a professional one. Some of the commanders wouldn't let them have real bullets to practice with, afraid that they'd all end up killing each other. But Emma did just as well as the rest, if not better. She could march for days, ride like a pro, and was a whiz with a musket. Damn! There were plenty of reasons she should have been caught. The close quarters, the fatigue. Her unit mates jokingly called her Our Woman because of her voice and her feet. So small that army regulation boots didn't even fit her. Frank was decidedly not impressed by the general chaos of the army in those early days, particularly the frequent visits to brothels. God-loving Emma was not into drinking or debauchery, which must have made it difficult for her to blend in. But it helped that her tentmate, Damon Stewart, took Frank under his wing. He assumed that Frank had lied about his age to get into the army, hence his baby face and squeamishness about swearing. His belief meant that others didn't question Frank. Plus, Frank already had a reputation as a bit of a lady killer from all of those saucy carriage rides back in Michigan. That guy may not approve of hedge creepers, but I've always heard he can slay. She spent most of her time tending to the sick. There were already a lot of them. Some 30% of the Army of the Potomac was sick before they even went to their first battle. Typhoid was carrying soldiers off left and right. She and her fellow Army nurses did what they could. They put up awnings around the sick tents and planted evergreen trees around them. And they dug out pits trying to deal with the torrential rains. Plus, as we've already covered, the city stank and it didn't help that it was overcrowded. And I can tell you now, D.C. is gross in the summer. Sorry, hometown, you know I love you, but... I've got to wonder if she ever met Clara Barton during this time, since they both would have been there, and if maybe Frank took Clara on a date. Yeah, probably not, but... What an image. Every day, Emma waited for their marching orders to come. The papers cried out for action with slogans like, Forward to Richmond. Then finally, in July 1861, it came. (laughs) 
The army set off with much music and fanfare, but she was dismayed by what became apparent on their first march to Manassas, Virginia, that even after months of drilling, the army was still a big, disorganized mess. They broke ranks, wandering off to pick blackberries, and stopped frequently to take off their still-not-broken-in boots. The army had roughly 33 miles to travel. Back in our century, by car, this would take us less than an hour. But it took the army several days. Picture a bunch of office workers strapping on heavy packs and heading down the Appalachian Trail with almost no training whatsoever. By the time they got to the field of battle, they were sunburned, parched, and tired. But they were also excited. This was it at last, their chance to win the war. Because remember, at this point, nobody really knew what they were in for. Spectators drove for miles around to watch the first Battle of Bull Run. They even brought picnic baskets. What should we do this Sunday, darling? I know, go watch people be shot. Everyone thought this war would be one battle and done. Little did they know the shitstorm that was about to hit them. But hit them it did. Emma watched as men got mown down, officers and privates and helpers alike. Their legs crushed, arms gone, grass running red. Now the battle began to rage with terrible fury. Nothing could be heard save the thunder of artillery, the clash of steel, and the continuous roar of musketry. With bullets whizzing around her, she rushed to get soldiers water and to help the wounded get to safer ground. I'm not really a battle connoisseur, so let's skip the ins and outs of this one in favor of a summary. The Union seemed to be making headway, but then things turned against them. The Confederates rallied, the Union buckled, the very inexperienced soldiers got scared, and so the great skedaddle began. Soldiers limped, ran, and drove stolen ambulances back to Washington, tails firmly between their legs. This wasn't just a defeat. It was a complete humiliation. But what really got Emma's goat was seeing soldiers run away from their duty. Many that day who turned their backs upon the enemy and sought refuge in the woods some two miles distant were found torn to pieces by shell or mangled by cannonball. Proper reward for those who, insensible to shame, duty for patriotism, desert their cause and comrades in the trying hour of battle and skulk away cringing under the fear of death. Emma certainly didn't run. She fell back for supplies in Centerville, then made her way to a stone church where the wounded were being kept. She was horrified to see bodies and amputated limbs piled up high, dying men with no water. She stayed with them as long as she could, hearing last words and confessions and, having no scissors, ripped away blood-soaked clothes from wounds with her teeth. In the end, she had to leave them behind and hide in the bushes to keep from being captured by the Confederates. It made shame burn in her that she wouldn't soon forget. By the time she stumbled back to Washington, Emma was feeling pretty disillusioned. First, because of all the death and dying she'd seen, but also because the sick tents were in complete chaos. Dysentery and typhoid were rampant. The wards were loud, disorganized, dirty. Oh, what amount of suffering am I called to witness every hour and every moment, she said. There is no cessation. But she also discovered the same phenomena as many Civil War nurses, that after a while, the horror faded away. And yet it is strange that the sight of all this suffering and death does not affect me more. I am simply eyes, ears, hands, and feet. More than that, she wasn't feeling good about the Army's moral fiber. Every barroom in groggery seemed filled to overflowing with officers and men and military discipline was nearly or quite forgotten for a time in the Army of the Potomac. So Emma was very pleased when the Army was taken over by one George McClellan. He'd go on to get in a lot of hot water for refusing to march on Abe Lincoln's say-so, but Emma had kind of a crush on this guy because of how he whipped the Army into shape, and also how much he disliked all of their bad behavior. He was known, when he saw some of his soldiers on the street, for making them pour their whiskey in the gutter. Boo! It was during this time that Emma made a friend. A rather studly friend. Private Jerome Robbins was also part of the 2nd Michigan Infantry, though a different company than hers. When they met, he was visiting a wounded friend where Emma was working, and they struck up a conversation that lingered on. They found they had much in common— They both loved learning and debating, God and General McClellan, 
and hated the immoral way so many of the soldiers in camp acted. Their friendship was a fast and deep one. They could easily talk for hours, like they'd known each other for years. Emma had long ago sworn off men, but there was something special about Jerome. Apparently, he was taken with her as well. He wrote in his diary about having pleasing conversations with Frank Thompson, of being impressed by his nursing skills. He is an assistant in the hospital, he wrote, and I think well able to win and repair the hearts of those about him. But he knew that there was something about Frank that he wasn't quite getting. A mystery seems to be connected with him, hard to name. Jerome made excuses to make frequent visits, sometimes multiple times a day. By November, Jerome became a steward there. They were joined at the hip, going to prayer meetings in the evenings, talking under the stars, taking long walks. Before long, they were even taking joint naps. I arose greatly refreshed, Jerome said, after a good sound sleep on a couch with my friend, Frank Thompson. Amidst all the chaos and the violence, Jerome became a safe harbor for Emma. She longed to tell this kindred spirit who she really was, but she was afraid to. What if he rejected her? What if he turned away, disgusted, never to return? There was another complication, too. Jerome had a girlfriend back home named Anna. He talked quite openly about his love for her. While Emma simmered with awkward feelings, she didn't really know what to do with. But there was definitely something between them. Emma couldn't lie to him anymore. One day, they walked together out onto Long Bridge. Her heart must have been pounding as she told him everything. About her family, her father, her run away from home. She couldn't have known it, but other secret soldier girls would go on to profess their love to friends in the army. And some of them do find that their love is returned. But some men, when they discover a woman amongst them, tattle and get them kicked out of the army altogether. This meeting was a very high stakes one for Emma that could answer her hopes or end in tragedy. It probably won't shock you to know that this little interview didn't go the way she hoped. Emma never wrote about this encounter, at least that we know of, so we can only imagine how she felt it. But Jerome wrote many pages in his diary about it. My friend Frank is a female. He wrote, I won't say that it is not strange to me. How sad is the reaction, which often occurs when we think we have friendship in exchange for friendship, and find that friend differing so widely from our own natures. Oh, Emma, I'm just really cringing for you right now. Jerome wrote for several pages about the interlude, his handwriting gone frantic and cramped. He underlined several words, among them, heart, her, feelings, real. The entry makes it clear that it was a heated exchange, and that they both left it upset and angry. Perhaps a knowledge on her part, he wrote, that there is one in a Michigan home that I do regard with a special affection, creates her disagreeable manner. Well, that's rude. But we can't judge Jerome too harshly. He'd been lied to by a friend, felt betrayed by her, and in a way that very much went against the Victorian era's mores and expectations for what a woman should be. Days passed, and Jerome didn't turn Emma in. From then on, he only wrote about her in his diary as Frank. It was dangerous knowledge to have. Men had been court-martialed for helping women disguise their sex. But he must have known it was dangerous for her as well. And in the end, he kept her secret. We don't know exactly what his feelings were for Emma, but it's clear he felt confused about them. He writes about missing Frank and wanting to talk to him. Frank seems somewhat displeased about something. I'm very sorry, but guess it won't last. Wishing that things between them weren't so strained. Suffice it that our confidence in each other is bound by Christian love, and I may hope some future time, when better convenience allow, a few leisure moments will be given in speaking of this friendship as one of the greatest events of my life. But Emma didn't know that. She was just mortified. Her only true friend had turned away from her. So she kept busy with nursing at another hospital and tried to avoid him at all possible cost. <laughs> In 1862, as the army mobilized, she came under the command of a Colonel Orlando Poe. Poe gave her a new duty, that of mail carrier. 
She got this job, Poe said later, because she was effeminate, and because he didn't want to take any strong-looking soldiers from the fighting ranks. Okay, Poe. Regardless, being a mail carrier was an important job. The only way to spread the word quickly was by letter or by telegraph, which most soldiers wouldn't have had access to, and sometimes just wasn't available. And Emma knew that. It was nothing short of a calamity for a heavy mail to be captured by the enemy. It was also a dangerous duty. Mail carriers were often overtaken by the enemy and shot. But being so good at riding, she excelled at it. She even named her horse Frank, of course. Oh, Emma. The army made their way by steamer boat and marching through mud down to the Virginia Peninsula. Emma would ride Frank out to neighboring farms and houses, trying to produce food for the army's ever-dwindling supply. It was in this way that she met with a bit of a misadventure. At one house, a woman came to the door and invited Emma in, rather cordially given the circumstances. As she meandered through the house, supposedly gathering supplies, Emma knew that something was off. I looked at her. She was trembling violently and was pale as death. But the woman gave her the supplies, and Emma got back on her horse. And so it was that the woman shot her. Well, she missed, but barely. Emma didn't think, she just reacted. She got out her pistol and shot the woman right through her palm. The woman, shrieking, tried to run away, but Emma tied her hands and led her back to camp. She did feel bad, though, so she let the woman sit on Frank for a while. But still, she told her in no uncertain terms that if she uttered another word or screamed, she was a dead woman. Damn, Emma. Apparently, Emma's captive ended up becoming a nurse for the Union Army. They called her Nellie, and she and Emma worked side by side for a while. Bit bizarre. It turned out that one of the Union's head detectives, Alan Pinkerton, needed help with his spying network. He needed to find some new recruits who could lie, pretend, be patient, cunning, and discreet. It was a very dangerous task. Men had been hanged for it. But she was ready to do something more than tend the sick. And she trusted that God had her back on this one. The subject of life and death was not weighed in the balance. I left that in the hands of my creator, feeling assured that I was just as safe in passing the picket lines of the enemy if it was goodwill that I should go there, as I would be in the federal camp. And if not, his will be done. And so she headed back to Washington for yet another examination. She was grilled by none other than heartthrob General McClellan, with questions about her loyalty and her allegiance. She passed that test, and then the firearms test, with flying colors. But once again, she was nervous about the medical exam. What if they asked her to strip down? What would she do then? But in the end, it was only a phrenological exam. You know, the practice of feeling one's head lumps. Which apparently proved her organs of secretiveness and combativeness were satisfactorily large. And you know what they say about small feet and big secretive lobes. hey And with that, she was officially a Union spy. Let's take a quick break so I can introduce you to some other magnificent ladies. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Nelson. And I'm Olivia Mickle. We're two academic sisters. And we host a podcast called What's Her Name? What's Her Name podcast tells you the stories of fascinating women that you've never heard of. We're unearthing the histories of really interesting women that have slipped through the cracks of our collective history. We add era-appropriate music. We interview really fascinating experts, everyone from professors to authors to the manager of a brothel museum. (laughs) We cover it all. So give it a listen. What's Her Name podcast dot com. She only had three days to prepare for her first mission, which was to steal her way into Yorktown, Virginia. But how would she get away with it, sneaking deep into Confederate territory? Well, she decided, she'd disguise herself as a black man, naturally. This sounds insane, I'm very aware. But apparently this was a relatively popular spy disguise. And it worked. Sometimes. Maybe because people weren't really savvy about spies yet. One thing that would have attracted Emma to this disguise is that, if caught by fellow contrabands, weren't likely to report you. In fact, they would probably help you. That was the name for African Americans who escaped slavery and were considered contraband of war. Without many ways of making a crust, many of them ended up working for both armies during the war 
usually doing manual labor, like building breastworks and other fortifications. She said she purchased a contraband suit of clothing, real plantation style, and then I went to a barber and got my hair sheared close to the head. Next, she got the postmaster to get her a wool wig from Washington. And then, how's this for commitment? She dyed her skin with silver nitrate. Say what? Head, face, neck, hands, arms, everything. She dyed her skin a different shade. The transformation was complete. She slipped out, past the pickets on guard duty, and spent the night hunkered down in the trees. From there, she attached herself to a group of contrabands and worked her way with them into a Confederate camp. Without much ceremony, she found herself working on a breastworks with about a hundred others, wielding a pickaxe, shovel, and wheelbarrow. By the end of the day, her hands were blistered raw. Afraid it would wear away the dye in her skin, she got another guy to switch duties with her. She was now a water carrier, which let her roam freely around the camp and listen in to conversations. That's what she did for two days, taking notes that she kept squirreled away in her boot heel. Which, you know, is kind of a rookie spy move. At some point, one of her fellow workers noted, and remember this is from the 19th century, so it's a little cringeworthy. I'll be darned if that feller ain't turning white. She looked down at her hands and saw that she was. And so she said, Well, Jimin, I allers expected to come white sometime. My mother's a white woman. And they all laughed. But can we appreciate her daring for a minute? This woman, pretending to be a man, walking around with dyed and probably very angry skin, in an enemy camp without any backup, or any clear way out. She had no one to rely on but herself. She had what she needed now, time to escape. But how? Later that night, as she carried dinner out to the pickets, a sergeant stopped her. A man had just been shot at his post and they needed a replacement double quick. He put a musket in her hands and said, And this is cringy. Now, you black rascal, if you sleep on your post, I'll shoot you like a dog. She was so close to the federal line. All she could do was wait until no one was looking, make a break for it, and hope for the best. As rain started coming down, washing over her skin, her disguise melted away in earnest, and she snuck away into the night with her gun. In the morning, tired and silver nitrate streaked, She convinced the federal pickets to let her back into home base. Success! She changed back into her uniform and, blistered and maroon-colored, went to report her intelligence to the higher-ups. And how did she feel about sleeping in the woods and narrowly escaping death? I'm naturally fond of adventure, a little ambitious, and a good deal romantic, and this together with my devotion to the federal cause made me forget the unpleasant items not only endure but really enjoy the privations connected to my perilous conditions. During her time in the army, Emma would go on several more spying missions, dressed as everything from an Irish peddler woman with a dubious accent to a southern male civilian. Though she often paid a price for going off-grid without any backup. Once, she got lost in the swamps around the Chickahominy River, and was so weak with fever and hallucinations that she lay there alone, without food or proper shelter, for days. It was, without question, one of her very roughest nights, and one whose consequences would follow her later. There I was, all alone, surrounded by worse, yes, infinitely worse than wild beasts, by bloodthirsty savages who considered death far too good for those who were in the employment of the United States government. Despite all the hardships, she was a successful spy, using both male and female guises to sneak right into the enemy's camp. I visited the rebel generals three times at their own campfire, with a period of 10 days and came away with valuable information. She had too many adventures for me to detail them all, so I'm going to give you one of my favorites, and the one that officially ended her spying career. She dressed up as a southern civilian boy, going door to door to find eggs and butter for the army. But really, she was trying to root out Confederate plans and guerrilla cells. At one house, she found herself crashing a wedding. The bride was a widow whose husband had been killed a few months back. I mean, when pickings are growing increasingly slim, you have to snap up whoever you can, am I right? The groom in question was a Confederate captain, tall, handsome, and a little too keen for Emma to join up. 
See here, my lad. He told her. I think the best thing you can do is enlist and join a company which is just forming here in the village and will leave in the morning. We are giving a bounty to all who freely enlist and are conscripting those who refuse. Which do you propose to do? He gave her two hours to make her decision, then placed her under guard so she couldn't run away. Thankfully, those guards were already pretty far into their cups and more than happy to answer Emma's questions about the army's numbers and movements. In the morning, off they rode, probably all a little hungover. Emma, their unwilling conscript. The handsome captain told her how grateful she'd be after all this was over. The more he talked, the more anxious Emma grew. She needed to get away from here ASAP. Luckily, they ran into a Union cavalry unit. There was a tussle, a confusion of guns firing, people yelling, and in all the confusion, the Union captain, who recognized Emma, waved her over to their side. The Confederate bridegroom was not best pleased to have been duped by Emma. He stared at her in abject horror, and in that moment, they both raised their guns. But Emma was the quicker draw, and she shot him directly in the face. Damn, Emma, you couldn't have gone for an arm or something? The bullet punched a hole through his nose, leaving him decidedly less pretty than he'd been before. I was sorry, she wrote later, for the graceful curve of his mustache was sadly spoiled. I'm not sure his facial hair situation would have been my main concern, but the 19th century mustache was not to be trifled with. When she wasn't spying, she was mail carrying or nursing at the battlefields. During the Battle of Gaines Mill in May 1862, as the army retreated, Emma found herself riding to the nearby hospitals to try and help evacuate staff and patients before the Confederates could take them prisoner. It was at one of these that she once again found Jerome. She urged him to leave with her, but he wouldn't abandon his patients. She must have begged him to come. If he were taken, who knew if he'd lived through it? But eventually she had to leave him behind, not knowing if she'd ever see him again. It was during a spot of mail carrying that Emma was thrown off a mule, who slipped in the mud, dumping her into a ditch, and then rolled over her. When she got back to camp, she knew her leg was broken. But like many lady soldiers, she wouldn't go to the doctor for fear she'd be discovered. Instead, she silently endured the misery and distress of an unfortunate accident entailed upon me, rather than be sent away from the army under guard like a criminal. To her, that was the most unspeakable horror. Months later, Emma still wasn't feeling well. She could feel herself bleeding internally. But at least she knew where Jerome was. He'd been captured, but treated well. Sent to Camp Parole in Annapolis. They wrote letters back and forth, some eleven of them from her and eight from him. That's more letters than he wrote to his girlfriend. Just saying. While Jerome was away, the army marched to just outside Fredericksburg, Virginia, and Emma found herself carrying mail between there and Washington. It was probably during one of these jaunts that she met the extremely tall, extremely Scottish, extremely dapper 26-year-old Lieutenant James Reed. There's a lot that we don't know about James Reed, but what we do know is pretty sexy. He joined the army with the 79th New York Militia, called the Highlanders, who showed up to Washington wearing proper tartan kilts. And now I pause to have a daydream about Jamie from Outlander. He was very unlike her friend Jerome. Tall, fair-haired and blue-eyed, loud and dashing, and married. But he impressed her nonetheless. When she arrived back at camp, she found the army unhappily sitting in snow and mud, waiting for orders. The army was either going into their winter quarters or taking Fredericksburg from the Confederates. Burnside's staff told him it was a bad idea, but off capturing, the army went. Several of our lady friends got to watch this particularly horrid battle, including Clara Barton and our surgeon friend, Mary Walker. After days of heavy fighting, Emma learned that Colonel Poe had lost his aide de camp. She volunteered to step in, wearing full military regalia. She rushed up and down the lines with him, carrying messages and dodging bullets. A fellow soldier said that she went with a fearlessness that attracted the attention and secured the commendation of field and general officers. But she also saw many awful things that seared themselves into her memory. She saw a man commit suicide on the field, and another shoot himself in the leg so he could get out of fighting. 
It was horrible to watch thousands of soldiers rush the city only to fall down in rows. And there, in the field, she saw a face that she knew. We're not completely sure if it was James Reed, the fiery Scotsman, but it might have been, and we sure hope it is. She pulled him off the field, gave him opium and whiskey, and soon he was riding back off into the field, leaving her to watch longingly, lustily, after him. Meanwhile, Jerome was finally being released from camp parole in December and making his way back to the army. He looked around camp for Emma, but couldn't find her anywhere. When he did, he thought they'd have a jolly reunion. Good friends, close confidants, who knows, maybe they could even be bunkmates. No, wait, Emma already had one, and he was tall, good-looking, and Scottish. Awkward! To be fair, we don't know what their relationship was, but we know that it was close. Quite close, according to her old flame Jerome. Have not had a very long chat with Frank, and I feel quite lonely without him. But I suppose he enjoys his tentmate. Reed seems a fine fellow, and is very fond of Frank. At this point, the army was tucked in for the winter, so soldiers didn't have a lot to do. Emma was a Christian woman, but still, as the months went by, he wondered what they talked about in that tent of theirs. When they all hung out, he made sure to mention his sweetheart Anne whenever possible. He must have done so quite a lot, because while away collecting mail, Emma sent Jerome a letter. Not one from Frank, tellingly, but signed, for the first time, with her real name. Dear Jerome, in the first place I will say that I am happy to know that you are prospering so well in matters of the heart. In spite of the ridicule which sentiment meets with everywhere, I am free to state that upon the success of our love schemes depends very much of our happiness in this world. Dear Jerome, I am in earnest in my congratulations and daily realize that had I met you some years ago, I might have been much happier now. But Providence has ordered it otherwise, and I must be content. I would not change now if I could, if my life's happiness depended on it. I do not love you less because you love another, but rather more for your nobleness of character displayed in your love for her. God make her worthy of so good a husband. Your loving friend, Emma. Woo, steamy. In talking about this potential love triangle, I don't mean to trivialize Emma's accomplishments, or even to imply that she was having a wild time in camp. Though, frankly, I hope she was. She deserved to have some fun and companionship between her bouts of malaria and shooting off mustaches. But I find their presence in her story fascinating. We already know that Jerome knew her secret, and that he had some complicated feelings about it. And, I imagine, about developing such a close friendship with a woman, which probably completely defied many of his notions about the fairer sex. But it also makes me wonder whether or not James Reed knew her true identity. Did he become a confidant for Emma? Someone to be herself with as she grew increasingly lonely and weary of a soldier's life? Or had she gotten so good at playing Frank that James never knew, even in such close confines? We'll never know, but it's an interesting thing to ponder. During these idle months, a story spread through camp like wildfire. A Union soldier had actually given birth in the field. Emma must have listened to the gossip keenly. The rank-and-file soldiers weren't mad about it. They admired the woman, although there was much tittle-tattle about who the father was. Her tentmate, probably. If Emma was doing anything steamy in her tent, this might have given her pause. Meanwhile, she'd grown tired of muddy marches in the Army's rotating carousel of commanders. They sure were no McClellans, as far as she was concerned. The weather department is in perfect keeping with the war department, and policy being to make as many changes as possible, and every one worse than the last. Things around her were changing, too. Orlando Poe, her boss and mentor, had his commission ending, and the dashing James Reed resigned to take his sick wife back to Scotland. Many of the friends she'd made early on in her three years of service had gone home, or were about to. Plus, the malaria from her time in the swamps had come back calling. She lay in her tent all day, suffering fevers, cramps, and hallucinations. Malaria's no joke, you guys. Her emotional scars were also catching up with her. One day a shell exploded in camp and it turned her, as she put it, into a Poor, cowardly, nervous, whining woman. She missed her family. She missed home. She was just... tired. 
I think I realized in those hours of feverish restlessness and pain, the heart yearning for the touch of a mother's cool hand upon my brow, which I had so often heard the poor sick and wounded soldier speak of. Through it all, Jerome nursed her. By night, he wrote entries that seemed both worried and a little jealous, peeved that his good friend had given her friendship to someone else. How strange are some of the incidents of life. It is unpleasant to awaken to the conviction that one, dear as a friend, can forget in their selfish interest that others may not be void of the finer sensibilities of the human heart. It is a sad reality to which we awaken when we learn that others are receiving the devotion of one from whom we only claim friendship's attention. Emma tried to get a medical furlough, but was knocked back. Finally, there was only one option left to her. She had to desert. Around April 17, 1863, Franklin Thompson vanished from the army. Deserting was a dangerous proposition. You could be hung for doing such a thing. And in most people's eyes, it was very shameful. But Emma didn't see it that way. I never for a moment considered myself a deserter. She said, I left because I could hold out no longer. But it seems she left a bit of a mess behind her. Before James Reed left the army, just a few days after Emma did, he paid a little visit to Jerome's tent. They had some words. We don't know what they were, but let's pretend they went something like this. Ah, I miss Emma. In my bed. Take that back, you horrid Scottish specimen. Ah, you're just jealous because she likes my kilt, laddie. At any rate, Jerome was angry. He'd been her friend, nursed her through illness, kept her secret, and told her all of his. Frank has deserted, for which I do not blame him. Yet he did not prepare me for his ingratitude and utter disregard for the finer sensibilities of others. Of all others whom I trusted as friends, he was the last I deemed capable of the petty baseness which was betrayed by his friend Reed. I think Jerome is being a little bit precious, to be honest. But he did have some really excellent hair, so he's got that going for him. The secret about Emma was out, and a lot of people were talking about it. We have been having quite a time at the expense of our brigade postmaster. Soldier William Boston wrote, He turns out to be a girl, and has deserted when his lover, Inspector Reed, and General Poe resigned. She went by the name of Frank, and was a pretty girl. Meanwhile, Emma made her way to Oberlin, Ohio, to recover from her illness, still living as a man. While there, she had some choices to make. Stay living as Frank, or put on a dress and be Emma again. After traveling back to Washington, Emma wrote Jerome a letter. She wouldn't say where she was, as she didn't want the army to find her. But she did say that she heard him and James had a little conversation about her. Care to share? She also requested he send a picture of himself. Oh, Jerome, I miss you so much, she said. Is there no person living whose presence would be so agreeable to me this afternoon as yours? She also said that she hoped that Anna had accepted his proposal of marriage. Well, she hadn't. Instead, she dumped him for someone else. This is your moment, Jerome. Cue romantic music. But he didn't go to Emma. Maybe he really did only feel friendship for her. Maybe he couldn't get over what she'd done. Either way, there's no evidence that suggests that they ever saw each other again. Emma packed her pants away and left Frank behind her. In terms of her outfits, anyway. In 1864, she relived all of his adventures in her memoir, Nurse and Spy in the Union Army. She used her own name to publish, Emma Edmonds, but neglected to name her male alias, after all, Frank Thompson had deserted the army, and the war was still ongoing. She made up regiment and officer names, too, or just gave them initials, to keep everyone fairly anonymous. It's for this reason that so much of what she writes, and who she's writing about, is hard to pin down. Later, she freely admitted that her book was part fact, part embellishment, drawn from other people's experiences as well as her own. But the underlying story checks out, and there's no reason to doubt Emma. Adventures with silver nitrate and all. The book was an overnight success. Turns out people were thrilled to read about a secret lady soldier. 
Unlike our friend Loretta Velasquez from last episode, who wrote in her memoir about her many romantic conquests and generally gave no dams about it, Emma's memoir stuck closely to the narrative arc of adventure books of the era. While she didn't join for a man like Fanny Campbell, pirate captain, she sticks to the female warrior bold motif by underlining her patriotism. Disappointingly, the book gives not even one good whiff of Scottish romance. Maybe because she thought that was what an adventure story featuring a female protagonist had to sound like. Maybe she was just very conscious that her wearing pants and going off to war were already going to ruffle feathers and didn't want to get too many panties in a twist. Either way, she was careful to paint her adventures in a clean, chaste, patriotic light. And as her publisher wrote in the book's foreword, perhaps she should have the privilege of choosing for herself whatever may be the surest protection from insult and inconvenience in her blessed, self-sacrificing work. The book sold some 175,000 copies. Uncle Tom's Cabin, the biggest, most explosive bestseller of the 19th century, sold 300,000. And what did she do with her newfound riches? Grab Jerome in a bikini and head down to Key West? Nope. She donates all of the proceeds directly to the Christian Commission and the Sanitary Commission to help wounded and veteran soldiers. She even dedicates the memoir to them. Imagine handing over that much money, a rare windfall for a woman at the time, and to a cause that you'd already given so much to. It tells us more about Emma than her book ever could. After that, she joined up with the army again, this time as a volunteer female nurse, which is how she served out the rest of the war. After that, she went home to visit her family. Both of her parents had passed away, but she was able to see her sisters and roam the woods with her brother. But it wasn't long before she grew restless, and no wonder. On the way back to Ohio to finish the college classes she'd started there, she found Linus Seeley, a fellow Canadian she'd met during her time nursing in Harper's Ferry. Turns out they had a bit of a spark between them. He accepted her for who she was completely, even with everything she'd done during the war. They tied the knot in Ohio in 1867. By all accounts, it was a happy marriage. But what must it have felt like for Emma to go from spy and freewheeling soldier to devoted, domestic wife? She wrote later, Well, you know how the census takers sum up all our employments with the two easily written words, married woman. That is what I became. And of course, that tells the entire story. And Emma was content to leave her story at that. At a time when many women were touring the country, giving dramatic reenactments of their time spying and fighting, she stayed quiet. While she was proud of her nursing, she seemed uncomfortable with all the spying, the lying, the scheming. What she'd done as Frank Thompson didn't all fit with her new life. So she did what many women soldiers did, left it behind her. She and Linus went on to have two boys, both of which died young, and a girl named Alice. By age 32, Emma's health wasn't great, in large part because of the malaria and injuries she'd suffered as a soldier, but she persevered. The couple adopted a pair of orphans, and then they moved to Louisiana to take up management of a home full of 67 more. These years were good ones for Emma. Much like our friend Clara Barton, she was always happiest when she was busy and giving back to others. But the muggy climate kicked up her old war wounds, and before long, she really wasn't feeling well. Misfortune followed. In 1880, her daughter Alice died, and with that, she'd lost all three of her natural-born children. She lay in a dark room for weeks on end, grieving for Alice. They moved to Fort Scott, Kansas for a fresh start. Many war veterans were also living there, with health complaints from their time in service. And before long, Emma realized they were all getting pensions. That sounded nice and fair. She thought she should be getting one, too. It was a gutsy move for a woman to go for a soldier's pension, especially when the government didn't want to admit women were there at all. And so began an uphill battle to prove that she, Emma, had been a soldier in the Union Army. There were a couple of hurdles to jump. First, she had to prove that she was, in fact, Frank Thompson. Second, she had to get the desertion charge scrubbed from her records. 
And of course, because she was a woman, she also had to prove that her motives and behavior had been chaste and pure and clean as the driven snow. A male soldier could drink himself silly and go to brothels to his heart's content, and he'd still get a pension for serving. But a woman in camp sleeping next to other soldiers was probably a prostitute, or a deviant, or a spy, or all three. And so she had to clear Frank's name while also clearing hers. Because, as my friends over at Queen's podcast would say, sometimes history's a bag of dicks. She sent a letter to Michigan's adjutant general, John Robertson, asking for Frank Thompson's certificate of service and saying that she and Frank were the same. He wrote back that he'd be glad to do it, but she'd only used her initials in the letter. He'd need the writer's name in full. So when Emma wrote back, she wrote freely and for the first time. My full name is Sarah Emma Evelyn Seeley. I enlisted and served as Franklin Thompson in Company F, 2nd Michigan Volunteers. Now she had to get some witness statements. In an era with no digital paper trail, no selfies, and no geotags, this was a crucial step. She couldn't ask Jerome. She needed people who hadn't known her secret while she served, as she worried it would look sketchy and potentially scandalous, to provide ones for men who had known and said nothing. So she asked Mr. Hurlbert, the publishing friend who'd given Frank Thompson a job way back when. She also went to see her old tentmate, Damon Stewart. Remember that guy? She walked into his dry goods store in Flint, Michigan, and asked if he could tell her where Frank Thompson was. Are you his mother? He said, confused. No. His sister, perhaps. Someone came up behind them, so she picked up a pencil and wrote on a scrap of paper. Quiet. I am Frank Thompson. He was so shocked and delighted that he invited her over to his house to meet his wife. He even invited a reporter along, who wrote a story all about Frank's wonderful and faithful service. She stayed with them for a full week, during which time many of their old buddies came by to see her. Each one of them wrote a letter in favor of her pension. After that, more and more of her old army buddies got in touch. They even made up a committee to help her win her pension. They invited her to a reunion of the 2nd Michigan, and though she was too sick to attend, she was touched that they wanted to see her. My brief message to the boys is this. Frank's heart beats just as warm and true as it beat under a regulation blouse. Tears are in my eyes, but I shall never ever forget your kindness to Frank Thompson. All I can say is that I am deeply grateful and thank you. Then Emma was invited to another reunion, where her friend Orlando Poe was excited to learn, after 20 years of wondering, what happened to his favorite mail carrier. The Michigan boys were all glad to see her. They clapped and yelled until she got up on stage. She said, Perhaps a spirit of adventure was important, but patriotism was the grand secret of my success. Some of the wives didn't share their enthusiasm because men weren't the only ones who suspected lady soldiers of being loose characters. We can't be tearing each other down, ladies. Honestly, lean in. Finally, on March 28, 1884, the House of Representatives passed House Bill No. 5335, which said, Truth is oft times stranger than fiction, that Frank Thompson and Mrs. Sarah E. E. Seeley are one and the same person as established by abundance of proof and beyond a doubt. She submits a statement, and also the testimony of ten credible witnesses, men of intelligence, holding places of high honor and trust, who positively swear she is the identical Franklin Thompson. It took quite a while longer, years in fact, for the government to lift the desertion charge, but it greatly relieved Emma when they finally did, and with it came her sign-up bonus and a veteran's pension of $12 a month. It was a big win for Emma. She was one of the first, and one of the only, female soldiers to be granted a pension. But even then, Congress played up her nursing and played down her soldiering. They made sure to say the nursing work she'd done at the end of the war, while wearing a dress, rendered much more valuable aid to the cause nearest her heart than she could possibly have done as a soldier. Whatever, Congress. Emma and Linus went on to build a new home in 1889, though they never quite had enough money to turn it into the home for indigent veterans she dreamed of. She occasionally wore pants and boots to work in the yard, which her neighbors wrote off as eccentric and kind of endearing. The local kids were scared of her because they'd heard she was a spy in the war. 
They made up a game where they would try to get up close to her without her shooting off any of their mustaches. She invited them in for some cookies instead. In 1897, she became a member of the Grand Army of the Republic, a nationwide Civil War veterans group. No other woman claiming to be a soldier had been admitted, but she was voted in, the only woman ever to be so. It was, to her, the greatest possible honor. It legitimized everything she'd risked and done for the army she loved. Emma finally died of malaria on September 5, 1898, at the age of only 56. She was buried in LaPorte, Texas, but was later moved to Houston's Washington Cemetery, to the Grand Army of the Republic gravesite, buried with full military honors. In his address to the 2nd Michigan in 1901, Colonel Frederick Schneider said, No war ever displayed so much bravery and devotion among women as did the Great Civil War. But none of the many instances recorded have surpassed the record for pure, unselfish patriotism and zeal for the cause of humanity, daring bravery and heroic fortitude as that of Sarah Emma Edmonds. The whole world made better for her having lived in it. Years later, in the 1920s, her obituary was found folded neatly into one of Jerome's journals. It read, A remarkable character has passed away. Emma was indeed a remarkable character. At 17, she ran away and became Frank Thompson, braving the threat of imprisonment and social exile to make her own way in the world. She joined the war effort, even though she didn't have to, saving lives and tending wounds no matter what it cost. She fought for her right to get the pension she'd worked so hard for, proudly defying the notion that women were never there at all. Emma was never afraid to fight for what she believed in. I hope one day to be as brave. Until next time. Bye! Thanks for listening to The Exploress. If you liked it, tell a friend and go and rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. It makes a way bigger difference than you think. For tons of great images of Emma's life and times, go to my Instagram at The Exploress Podcast. Catch up with me on Twitter at The Exploress Pod or Facebook at The Exploress Podcast. To support the show and get exclusive access to bonus episodes, become a patron by going to Patreon and looking up The Exploress. I'd love to see you there. For a transcript of this episode, a list of suggested reading, tons of images, and more, go to my website at www.theexploresspodcast.com. A huge thank you to Paul Gablonski for my theme music and logo, and to the following legends for their vocal stylings. Claire Burke is our adventurous Emma Edmonds. Avery Downing as the dapper Jerome Robbins, Simon Denatris as our Scottish rogue James Reed, and John Armstrong, Andrew Goldman, and Phil Chevalier. Next time on The Exploress. The mid-19th century holds certain truths to be self-evident, that ladies are far too sweet too chaste, and too gentle to be spies. These preconceived notions only helped women become some of the American Civil War's most successful secret agents, lying, manipulating, and smuggling more things under their crinolines than you could fit into the back of your car. They flirted with generals and very real danger, risking everything to help win the cause they dearly loved. Grab your sewing kit, your cipher, and some disappearing ink. Let's go traveling.